Hello, everyone. Um, I am Therese Amble, and I am a pediatric psychologist at Children's Hospital in um, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I work in our psychology department, um, but actually spend most of my time in the hospital in our sleep clinic, um, working with our sleep team with infants, um, young adults um, with behavioral um, sleep disorders. Um, so today I um, get the privilege of talking to you guys about um, pediatric um, sleep. Let me make sure I can cruise through here. All right. Um, so it's a big topic, so there's a lot I could cover, um, but thinking about the time that we have today, I decided to really um, hone in on just covering normal sleep um, in children and adolescents, um, looking at, um, um, looking at um, developmental and psychosocial factors and how they um, impact sleep. Um, and then I'm going to present some common um, pediatric behavioral sleep disorders um, and guidelines for treatment. So as you all know, um, in order to know when sleep is a problem, we need to first know and understand normal sleep. So that's why we'll dive into normal sleep um, patterns and habits across development. And I'll highlight along the way factors that influence sleep at each age range. So newborn zero to three total sleep time about 13 to 18 hours, um, but quite a bit of variability. Typically sleep episodes are about three to four hours sleeping um, with about one to two hours awake with formula fed babies sleeping for longer periods than breastfed babies. So as we know, there's no established um, nocturnal or diurnal pattern in these first weeks. So unfortunately for parents, sleep is fairly evenly distributed between day and night. Um, at this stage, sleep-wake cycles are highly linked to hunger and feeding. So circadian rhythms and environmental cues are going to play a much smaller role in the first 10 to 12 weeks as that circadian rhythm is still developing. So sleep is going to be quite irregular. Important at this stage um, is helping parents with safe sleep practices, um, coach parents to be mindful and attuned um, to baby signs of drowsiness, so rubbing eyes, yawning, fussiness, so that they can use those cues to guide sleep um, periods. Um, critically important is um, parental sleep needs to be a priority we're thinking about. Um, sleep deprivation is associated with increased um, maternal stress and is a significant risk factor um, for postpartum depression. So this is really important. Some common um, sleep issues um, at this time is that day-night reversal um, that we talked about. And then um, because babies spend about 50% of their total sleep time in REM, they're really active sleepers. So they're often going to be moving, sucking, smiling, grimacing, which parents can sometimes misinterpret as restless or disrupted sleep. So we can provide some education. <clears throat> Most sleep issues that are perceived um, as problematic at this stage really just represent a discrepancy between parental expectation and developmentally appropriate sleep. So support and education um, is important. Infants four to 11 um, months, 12 to 15 hours total sleep time. Again, great variability. This is when naps typically are gonna decrease from four naps a day, to about two in a morning and afternoon nap by about six months. Sleep regulation or sleep so or self-soothing um, occurs at this age range, and it involves the infant's ability to independently fall asleep. So that um, ability to independently fall asleep, um, to transition from being awake to being asleep on their own, um, is one of the most important tasks in the development of sleep during early childhood. And it's both a reflection of um, neurodevelopmental maturation and of learning. <clears throat> So closely related to self-regulation, sleep consolidation or sleeping through the night um, is generally achieved in this age range. So infants develop the ability to start to be able to consolidate sleep into longer chunks of time between six weeks and three months. And most are gonna reach that milestone of sleeping continuously through the night on a regular basis by about nine months. 
So some developmental issues. So achievement of gross motor milestones, which of course happen frequently in this age range, can temporarily disrupt sleep. Important at this stage is parent-child relationship and interaction, which we know is going to impact the quality and quantity of sleep. Um, attachment has been found to be a factor that influences sleep behavior um, and sleep regulation. So for example, children with secure attachments have been found to sleep for longer periods and have um, increased sleep efficiency. The development of object permanence is going to result in some separation anxiety, which can lead to some increased bedtime resistance and problematic night wakings. So important at this age is starting to establish consistent bedtime routines, um, when appropriate, introducing some small transitional objects to help with um, independent settling and self-soothing. Our goal is really to work with parents to help them work towards putting their babies down drowsy but awake by about three to four months um, to promote that self-soothing. On each slide, I also have listed some common sleep disturbances and prevalence rates that will be there for your reference. So toddlers, one to three years, total sleep time about 11 to 14 hours. This is when we're going to see um, kids move from two naps a day to one afternoon nap, often between about 12 to 18 months. This is the age that kids commonly transition from being in a crib to being in a bed. So some developmental issues, um, that wonderful emerging drive for independence and autonomy we see in toddlers, coupled with their um, increased um, mobility, um, will definitely lead to some increased bedtime resistance and limit testing behavior. And we can see that during the bedtime routine, um, getting out of bed, crawling out of the crib. Separation anxiety can be common during this time. It can be associated with bedtime difficulties or more night wakings. And then that drive to learn and just a really rapid development of new skills during this time and the development of imagination um, can result in some increased difficulty with settling at night and we start to see um, some nighttime fears come on board. So important at this stage is routines, um, nighttime and daytime routines, introducing transitional objects. Um, naps should continue at this age. Um, so, so most kids in this um, age range are still napping and should be. Um, so it's not uncommon. Um, I see this a lot, and I think understandably, as parents will um, stop having their kids nap and hope that it will help the nighttime sleep. But what we see is it usually makes sleep problems worse. Not only are kids very difficult to deal with during the day, um, but it can actually make it harder for them to settle as they're overtired. So we wanna make sure that parents are maintaining that important daytime sleep. And then important is that kids continue to sleep in cribs. If they're not crawling out of their cribs and it's not um, a risk, um, then we really encourage parents to keep kids in their cribs until they're closer to three. Before that age, kids often just don't have the cognitive development or the behavioral control to stay within the imaginary boundaries um, of a bed. Um, so waiting can be really helpful. Um, and just like toilet training, if parents attempt to transition to a bed and it doesn't go well, um, they should just be encouraged to go back to the crib and try again at a later age. Preschoolers, three to five, total sleep time about 10 to 13 hours. This is when we see kids move from that afternoon nap to no longer napping. It's not a light switch. It's typically a long period of time that can be challenging with days, some days that they nap and some days that they don't. Because this is the peak age for slow wave sleep, it's the peak age for um, disorders of arousal like night terrors and sleepwalking, and is a peak age for obstructive sleep apnea because of enlarged tonsils. So um, ever increasing language and cognitive skills um, at this preschool age can um, result in um, increased and, and maybe even more savvy bedtime resistance. Um, this is kind of the age that kids start to articulate more about their needs and engage in limit testing. It's a really common age um, of kids coming out wanting one more book, one more drink of water, one more hug. Um, and then the... Um, um, further, the developing of those cognitive skills um, and um, development of imagination and fantasy um, during this time period um, make this age range a common um, age range for nighttime fears. 
so important at this stage um, is helping families to establish a consistent sleep-wake schedule and consistent daytime routines to support that regular sleep schedule. Um, um, a bedtime routine is essential. An appropriate bedtime for most kids at this age range is about 7.30 to 8.30. And we wanna really make sure we work with families to keep electronics out of the bedtime routines and out of the bedrooms. School-aged children, this is when we start to see a discrepancy between what kids need and what they're getting. So we see them getting about nine to 10 hours of sleep and needing about nine to 11 hours of sleep. This is when we start to see differences between how much sleep kids get on the weekdays and weekends um, and, and see some inconsistency in those sleep schedules. Um, because school-aged children should be highly alert during the day and have really low levels of daytime sleepiness, um, something to keep your eye on is that naps and falling asleep during the day should be rare. Um, and, and if they're present, you know, is really a sign for us of insuff insufficient sleep. So some um, developmental issues um, that comprehension of the existence of real dangers um, can result in increased fears, but also just a shift in the content in those fears, right? We'll see a shift from more of the fantasy like monsters to real world dangers like a fire or someone breaking in the house, um, which is what I see most commonly kids fearful about school aged children. You know, increasing independence, especially as they're getting close to adolescence. <clears throat> Um, you know, we'll start to see some parents have less awareness about health habits. So parents will be less aware about when kids are shutting off the light or what electronics are in their room. Um, and then increasing academic, social, family, extracurricular demands can all start to um, compete with sleep um, and can also make for some increased worrying for kids at bedtime. And then increasing media and electronic use, you know, which we've seen even more prevalent over the pandemic with distance learning really starts to compete with sleep and interfere with sleep as well. So important at this age is the development of healthy sleep habits. Some important ones to hone in on are media and electronic use in the bedroom. I'm really working with parents um, to help them keep electronics out of the bedroom for kids to um, improve sleep, to hopefully restrict but um, caffeine, but you know, if, if they are having some to make sure that it's happening earlier in the day and it's limited, and then really trying to maintain that consistent sleep-wake schedule. Hmm. Um, it's a, um, important too that parents stay aware of kids' sleep habits, um, bedtimes, um, and what they're doing at night in their rooms, and that we're screening for signs of insufficient sleep in this group as we see um, more kids getting insufficient sleep um, in the school age period. So adolescent sleep. Um, <clears throat> This is um, when we see an even larger discrepancy between um, what teens need and what they're getting. So on average, they're getting about a seven and a quarter hours of sleep with it unevenly distributed um, between weekdays and weekends um, with less sleep during the week. But really, they need, you know, about nine to nine and a quarter hours of sleep. Um, adolescent sleep is typically characterized by really late bedtimes, really early high school rise times, napping and a lot of oversleep on the weekends. <clears throat> Although we'll typically see throughout adolescence, teens getting less and less sleep, important to know that the need for sleep does not decline during this time period. So developmental issues, you know, as we know that two hour physiologically based phase delay is going to result in some lower physiologic signaling to fall asleep at an earlier time. You know, teens just simply aren't sleepy at the time that they were before they're getting sleepy later. And then when we, you know, couple that with a lot of nighttime media use, you know, particularly again during the pandemic and with distance learning, um, less parent awareness, um, even more academic, social, um, extracurricular job demands. Um, and then we couple that with a really early high school start time. It's kind of this perfect storm um, that has led to adolescents being um, a very sleep deprived um, bunch with adolescent sleep really being a major um, public health issue. So important at this stage, I'm a 
um, you know, broken record, but healthy sleep habits, really working with teens um, to find some motivation, you know, um, where they can prioritize sleep to include it in their schedule. Um, that we're screening for insufficient sleep um, and that we're providing a lot of education about insufficient sleep and the consequences um, and making sure for those teens who are um, driving um, that that conversation includes education about drowsy driving and the, um, you know, the dangers of, you know, driving under the influence of insufficient sleep. So in addition um, to the developmental and environmental factors that can lead to sleep problems, as we just discussed, <clears throat> some other common causes of sleep problems, of course, include the presence of a primary sleep disorder, um, such as obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome. Um, you know, sleep disturbances are commonly associated with both acute and chronic medical conditions. Um, and, you know, some of the common ones listed here and then psychiatric disorders and sleep problems, you know, as you guys know, commonly coexist and really represent a complex relationship um, with sleep difficulties um, being a risk factor for the development of psychiatric disorders and the presence of a psych disorder often being associated with sleep disruption. <clears throat> Also, there's, there's a lot of overlap between symptoms of psych disorders and consequences of insufficient sleep, you know, such as inattention, hyperactivity, um, mood lability, disruptive behaviors. <clears throat> and, you know, to complicate things further, the presence of a sleep problem will often impact um, um, psychiatric symptom severity. So a really complex um, relationship um, and really important for us to be thinking um, about both when we're treating a child um, or teen. Um, some of the, um, you know, you know, virtually all psychiatric disorders in children and adolescents can be associated with sleep disruption, but some of the most common are listed here on the slide, um, with those being ADHD, depression, anxiety, and neurodevelopmental um, disorders such as autism spectrum disorder. So as um, I um, talked about, I think this diagram nicely highlights the importance um, of kind of stepping back and considering the role of multiple factors that affect sleep for children and teens. So we wanna think about the sleep environment and sleep practices, the health of the child, developmental, social, and emotional factors, as well as the family and culture, cultural context in which um, sleep problems occur. <clears throat> And then the, you know, dynamic um, bi-directional relationship among these factors and, you know, the micro and macro systems in which sleep occurs, you know, knowing that those environments are also going to influence a child's sleep. You know, for example, um, something such as school start times um, really playing an important role um, in the child's system that impacts their sleep. So um, we talked about kind of average amounts of sleep kids get, um, but the common, you know, the most common question I get is how many hours of sleep does my child need? Um, and that great question, you know, doesn't have a, a simple answer. Of course, there's recommended ranges that most kids are going to fall, um, you know, between. But, you know, that being said, there's great variability and some kids are going to need more sleep and some kids are going to need less. So, you know, we're often thinking about is the sleep um, that the child in front of me is getting enough for them. And, and one of the best ways that we can think through that is by screening for signs of insufficient sleep. So, you know, some signs that we look for in kids and teens is, um, you know, if they need to be woken by an alarm or a parent daily, they're not waking spontaneously. Um, and, you know, it's described as a battle and it's really difficult to get them up and get going. Um, on weekends or vacations, they're sleeping at least two hours or more per night than they are on school nights. Um, like we said, they should have, you know, once we're past the napping age, they should have high um, levels of alertness and low levels of daytime sleepiness during the day. So any falling asleep during um, inappropriate times, such as sedentary activities, during school, doing homework, TV, you know, short car rides, those are all a concern for getting insufficient sleep. And then if parents are noticing that, you know, on spring break or summer vacation, when they're able to get more sleep, that, that they really see that their behavior or mood is notably different. <clears throat> 
following nights that they're getting more sleep. Another sign that kids aren't getting enough. So as you know, insufficient sleep is related to many problems during the day. Um, chronic sleep loss can cause excessive daytime sleepiness and impact, um, you know, numerous domains of functioning listed here. Um, I'm not going to go through, you know, them all, but I think, you know, just thinking about when we, when we look at all these significant and really pervasive consequences, that it just highlights how important it is that we assess for and treat sleep problems as it really does directly relate to a child's overall health, development, their well-being, and their functioning. Um, and, you know, as, you know, the last bullet point too, you know, thinking about that pediatric sleep is really impacting the whole family unit as well. So first I will um, dive into common behavioral sleep problems in young children, zero to five. But of course, before we implement any specific interventions, you know, we always wanna set the foundation for good sleep by making sure healthy sleep habits are in place. Helping kids early establish healthy sleep habits can really prevent many behavioral sleep problems that can emerge over time. So um, going quickly through this list, you know, we want a consistent sleep schedule every night. We want parents to set and enforce an age appropriate bedtime for most young kids between 7 and 8.30 for most school age kids before 9 p.m. We want parents to implement a consistent bedtime routine, create a comfortable and a consistent sleep environment. So cool, dark and quiet. We want to work towards kids falling asleep independently. Um, you know, we want to work towards having technology free bedtime routines and bedrooms, a lot of bright light, um, sun exposure in the morning and during the day. <clears throat> we want kids to get outside, um, limit caffeine intake, certainly restrict um, before um, noon for young kids. You know, caffeine isn't recommended at all. Um, and then, you know, have kids work towards using the bed only for sleeping. Really tricky, um, you know, in general for teens, but especially during the pandemic with a lot of kids spending more time in their rooms and on their beds. So helping families find spaces in the house or even setting up chairs or areas in the room so that kids have comfortable places that are inviting for them to spend off their bed. And then for um, young kiddos working with families to make sure the crib or bed isn't used for timeout. So sleep habits have been found to be associated with how well children sleep. Um, authors in one study looked at factors associated with problematic sleep um, in kids um, zero to 10 using the um, National Sleep Foundation Sleep in America poll in 2004 and found that sleep habits were significantly associated with how well children sleep. So here is a list of poor sleep habits that were associated with more disruptive sleep. Across all age ranges, a late bedtime, which they defined as 9 p.m., um, and having a parent present when the child um, falls asleep, they both had the strongest negative association with reported sleep patterns, um, both of those being associated with um, a shorter total sleep amount. Um, and a late bedtime being associated with taking longer to fall asleep um, and parental presence at bedtime being associated with more night wakings. So needing, so sleep onset associations and night waking. So needing a parent to fall asleep and then having frequent night wakings, needing the parent again to return to sleep is one of the most common behavioral sleep problems that we see for infants and toddlers ages six months to three years. So of course, wakings can occur for a variety of reasons, but typically what we find is that it's related to a negative sleep onset association. So briefly, sleep onset associations are conditions in the sleep environment that have been repeatedly paired with falling asleep such that the child has learned to need it in order to sleep. Um, we all have them as adults. For most people, it's being in a bed and a pillow and a blanket. So we put them into two categories, positive and negative, not good or bad, but um, on, based on whether it requires parent presence. So positive ones don't require parent presence. And there are things such as sucking a thumb, white noise machine, a passy, you know, when the child can independently reinsert it or a small lovey. Negative ones are going to require parent presence. So those are things such as bottle or breastfeeding, rocking the child, lying with the child, driving the child in the car to fall asleep. All of those things require a parent to be there to self-soothe. So um, another common question I get from parents is, you know, 
why does how they fall asleep at the beginning of the night, why does that impact the middle of the night at all? I don't really care how they fall asleep. I just want them to stay asleep. So we can provide a lot of education that nighttime wakings are normal and that kids are going to go through sleep cycles, you know, about four to six times at night, having normal wakings. And it's not the waking that's problematic. It's their inability to return to sleep, to self-soothe on their own. um, That's resulting in the the problematic night wakings and the signaling for parents. So um, when we think about treatment, kind of first things first, is we, of course, want to assess and treat medical disruptors to sleep that are common in young kids. Um, We want to establish um, an appropriate bedtime, make sure they're maintaining that important daytime um, nap, that they establish a bedtime routine, that we're keeping the sleep environment consistent. So noise and lights that are on when the child falls asleep, we want those to stay on all night long. Introducing a transitional object, really just seeing how we can set the stage for the parent to put the child to bed, drowsy but awake. And then sleep training approaches um, for night wakings um, really involve helping the child learn to independently settle to sleep um, without that negative sleep onset association. We typically are using either standard extinction or graduated extinction approaches. So standard extinction is what most people might refer to as cry it out. Um, It's one of the fastest interventions to address night wakings, typical success in about three to five days. For this approach, parents will put the child in the crib drowsy but awake, um, and then um, they won't respond to any crying or protests until the morning. Of course, they're going to be watching them on a monitor and assessing for any health or safety concerns and can do a brief check, but they're not interacting. And they're doing this until the child is falling asleep and staying asleep on their own. Graduated extinction, um, which is the most common intervention that I'll use with families because I think it's more tolerable for most, um, also involves the child falling asleep without that negative sleep onset association, um, but involves sort of greater interaction between the parent and the child, um, which I think just puts parents at ease and can sometimes result in less crying. Um, So two approaches, either with um, parent presence or without. Um, Without is a checking method. So parents, after they put um, kiddo to bed drowsy but awake are returning at um, set intervals, which is really just based on parent tolerance and the child temperament. And, you know, using like a a sleep phrase, I love you, it's time to sleep, a brief 30 second or less check, um, and then leaving the room and continuing to check in those intervals until the child falls asleep. Um, Parent fading presence, um, you know, is the same, except for if the parent is kind of starting involved, um, you know, they might slowly decrease the amount of minutes that they rock a child, then put them in the crib with maybe their hand on their back, and then slowly stand next to the crib, and then maybe a foot away from the crib, slowly making their way out of the room at the beginning of the night. For most infants, learning to self-soothe and fall asleep on their own at bedtime will generalize to the middle of the night within about two weeks. So I'm, when I'm working with families, I'm usually having them first focus on the beginning of the night and then in the middle of the night responding as they normally would. So some helpful hints quickly, Um, you know, parent education and buy-in is really critical. Um, So I spend a lot of time with parents on the front end, um, um, talking about the rationale for the treatment approach um, and um, answering questions. So many parents worry about long-term emotional damage um, because of prolonged crying. So, you know, I provide reassurance based on research that there's no empirical support for any long-term negative consequences of sleep training. Um, you know, we want to manage um, parental expectations. So we talk about average crying that it typically um, kids will cry longer the second night, maybe the third before things get better. <clears throat> I'm really just working with a family to see what they're comfortable on, how quickly or slowly they want to move and problem solving barriers, knowing that consistency is key to success. So we want to meet families where they're at and come up with a plan that they can be consistent with so that they can have success. So when is sleep training not appropriate? So a child younger than six months, you know, any child who um, hasn't been cleared by their pediatrician because of the prolonged crying, um, some medical conditions such as seizure disorder or severe reflux, um, children with severe anxiety or trauma histories, and of course, for families who value co-sleeping and are um, looking to change that. 
Um, so bedtime problems, um, most common in um, young children, two to six. This is when you'll see parents complain about bedtime taking a long time. The child stalling, refusing to participate in the routine. There's a lot of arguments or conflicts at bedtime, tantrums when parents um, try to put them in bed and leave multiple what we call curtain calls where kids are calling out repeatedly from the bed or leaving their bed uh, bedrooms. Um, so bedtime problems are really frustrating for parents. Um, and even for the most um, patient and structured um, parent, bedtime problems um, can be really challenging and exhausting. Um, everyone is tired at bedtime. Um, and um, um, emotions are often running high, and patience is running low, um, which can make providing consistent responses to challenging behaviors tough, which can often fuel bedtime problems. Um, so I'm always working with families, you know, to make sure, of course, that they're that they're setting up an appropriate bedtime, consistent sleep schedule, healthy sleep habits. But we're often, you know, starting as well on discussing limit setting so that parents have strategies for handling non-compliant behaviors at bedtime. Quickly, some of those being establishing clear bedtime rules and the importance of being consistent and following through. You know, we want parents to have um, rules that are the same each night so kids know what to expect and that can help with less limit um, testing. Using clear commands, you know, it's time for bed versus are you ready for bed. Um, using forced or acceptable choices, you know, it might not be a choice um, if we brush our teeth, but we could have some choices within the routine, like what pajamas we wear or what toothpaste we use. <clears throat> because it's hard for kids to transition from um, preferred activities to a non-preferred activity like the bedtime, um, you know, we really want to help them with those transitions. So we want to be using transition cues. We have 10 minutes, we have five minutes. Um, using visual timers can be really helpful. Have kids get involved in flipping over the sand timer, goes off, we blame it on the timer. Timer says it's time for us to put the game away. Um, teaching parents to use their attention strategically, so to really direct their attention and catch their child being good when, um, you know, they're following the bedtime rules and then ignoring kind of complaints or protests. And then, you know, helping parents to understand that when they change or make modifications to bedtime rules, that um, behaviors are often going to get worse. Kids are going to challenge and push more before it gets better. So consistency is really important. <clears throat> So bedtime routine, um, it's a common and simple behavioral intervention, but it's really an essential part of any sleep treatment plan for a child. Um, it's an important part of helping the tr child transition from um, being awake um, and winding down to go to sleep. And it, it signals to their circadian timing system that sleep is coming and it helps their body prepare for sleep. Um, so a good routine um, typically has about three to five quiet activities, about 20 to 45 minutes, occurs in the same order and at the same time every night. Um, one study examined the effectiveness of a bedtime routine just as a standalone intervention and found that having a bedtime routine versus not was associated with a shorter sleep onset latency and a decrease in the number, duration of wakings and less problematic behaviors. Um, another study in 2015 assessed if there was a relationship between how many nights per week a family does a bedtime routine and sleep outcomes and found a really nice linear dose dependent relationship um, that the more nights per week that a family does a um, uh, bedtime routine, um, the better the sleep. So we know that a bedtime routine is a very important and powerful part of a sleep intervention for, for kids. So the plan, you want to you want to keep it simple. Um, you don't want to have too many steps, but we're also talking about kids here. So we want to make it fun and playful. <clears throat> um, they don't want to go to bed. So we, we need we need to be a little fun ourselves when we're doing this. Um, it's often helpful to make the first and the last last activity preferred one. So that might be starting with a bedtime snack or for kids, you know, it's even starting with just a fun way that we get upstairs, right? We get to pick what animal we are and then we act like that animal while we go up the stairs. You know, as a parent, I don't care if my kid flies like a bird or hops like a frog upstairs as long as we're getting upstairs um, and it can really help with that transition. Um, the last activity could be preferred like reading a book or snuggling. 
I find it helpful to move in one direction. Um, so to move from the kitchen and anything we need to do there, like the uh, bedtime snack to the bathroom. Now we're going to do our bath, go to the bathroom, brush our teeth, and then last move to the bedroom to do our PJs and settling down. I think this helps reduce distractions. It's kind of a one way um, a one way street as we're getting ready for bed and all find fun ways to have kids kind of go through their routine. Like, you know, if they like Daniel Tiger, you know, then they can jump on the trolley and the trolley goes from the kitchen to the bathroom and then from the bathroom to the bedroom. Um, you know, the parents get bonus points for making trolley noises and getting kids excited. <clears throat> Um, we want to keep electronics out of the routine and out of bedrooms. Some helpful hints is you can add a bedtime chart or picture schedule. There's one on the slide, lots of different ways you can make them, um, but a visual chart for kids to know what's going to happen next um, and to keep the routine really consistent can be helpful. Um, if there's a really difficult step that's challenging every single night, for example, a child with sensory sensitivities and the bath is really hard every night, um, it might be helpful just to move that step out, right? Make it before dinner, or after school, so that the bedtime routine can be more of a calming time rather than that activating um, experience. <clears throat> Reward each step of the routine, so stickers, high fives. You know, I've had some parents make charts with Velcro and kids just get excited when they finish the step taking it off, right? That's reinforcing in and of itself. So finding ways to reward the kiddo as they're moving through the routine. Often just increasing how much parents are involved in the routine can help. Of course, we all want to be putting the dishes away or making lunches or doing other things, but the more a parent is involved in there, usually the better routine goes. Um, and then if kids are really falling apart and having a hard time, um, something just simple to try is to move it earlier because it might be that they're just getting overtired um, and that you'll have a more compliant kiddo if you start earlier. Um, bedtime pass is one of my favorite um, interventions. So um, this is for um, kiddos three to 10 who are engaging in curtain calls. Um, so calling out from their bed or coming out of their bed repeatedly after bedtime. Um, so the bedtime pass is an extinction-based intervention. It just involves giving the child a card um, that can be exchanged for an allowable call out or allowable parent visit out of the room. After that, subsequent requests are ignored. Um, our goal is really just to reduce those curtain calls and improve their ability to stay in bed, settle more quickly and on their own. <clears throat> Randomized controlled trials that's been found to be effective in reducing bedtime resistance or those curtain calls, falling asleep more easily um, with improvements maintained at three months. Uh, parents also find it to be um, an um, easy to use intervention that they like. So what you do, you decide on the number of passes you're going to give. I usually always give one, but for um, kids who are coming out of their room a lot or who really struggle with impulse control, I might give two. And then you actually create a pass. So it's important that it's not the idea of having a pass, but there's an actual physical card. You know, we'll make it together. Um, you can put things on there the kid likes. At bedtime, you know, parents will kind of talk about the rules. So what can the card be used for? It's good for a drink, another hug, one more tuck in, a quick question. What is it not good for? It's not good for a movie or another book or another snack because the kitchen's closed. So we go over those rules, give it at bedtime. <clears throat> And then if the child has their pass and they call out or come out, then parents calmly meet that request, right? It's allowable, so there's no frustration. After that, they tuck them back in bed. They let them know you don't have any passes left. It's time to go to sleep. Um, call outs after that point are ignored, or if a child comes out, they're um, returned to bed with minimal interaction. And I coach parents just to simply say, you don't have any passes left. It's time to go to sleep. Um, and I and I tell kids that we, we practice like and if you get out and you don't have your card, what is mom and dad going to say? So they kind of know to expect that parents are going to say you don't have any passes left. It's time to go to sleep. So importantly, because we don't want kids coming out at all, if they don't use their pass, they get to trade it in in the morning for a small prize, such as a small toy or a sticker where they can work towards a bigger prize. <clears throat> So some helpful hints, role play with younger children, you know, make sure parents know that the key to success is consistency. Um, I use this often for kids who are anxious and fearful um, and are having trouble and working on um, falling asleep on their own. You know, they have the control. If I want to come out and see my parent, I can. But if I'm brave and I stay in bed, you know, I can earn my prize. <clears throat> but I'll often combine it with other strategies like um, scheduled checks, uh, reward systems, um, and of course, anxiety management strategies.
So bedtime fading, um, a great tool when kids are falling asleep much later than their bedtime, right? Which can be the case for these bedtime problems or kids who are highly anxious. So they're falling asleep one, two hours later than when parents are actually putting them to bed. Um, that time, in my experience, is typically filled with a lot of conflict and negative parent-child interactions. Parents are usually not thrilled if their kids are coming out of their bed for hours after bedtime. Um, so it can be a really challenging time. <clears throat> So bedtime fading um, used in conjunction with other interventions just consists of temporarily delaying the bedtime to closely coincide with when the child's currently falling asleep, with our goal being really to reduce that resistance, promote a more smooth bedtime process, and help them fall asleep more quickly. Um, at once kids are falling asleep more quickly with the new routines and at that delayed bedtime, we're just moving um, back until a desired um, age-appropriate bedtime is reached. So um, we're monitoring sleep onset, you know, I'm getting a sense from parents when they're typically falling asleep, then we're setting that new bedtime, usually about 15 minutes earlier than when they're falling asleep. We're adjusting when we're going to start the routine. I usually will make sure though that, um, that we're setting up longer quiet times and wind down routines um, to really build up to that later time. Importantly, we're choosing a set wake time and making sure parents are consistent with that. And like I said, then we're shifting it earlier as sleep gets better. Um, so helpful, you know, tips, we want to provide education on why we're doing the later bedtime. Understandably, most parents um, know it's not good for their young kid to be going to bed at 10 p.m. So I'm often providing education that, you know, that this is currently the time the kiddo is falling asleep and that we're not trying to get them less sleep. We're trying to change um, kind of the current habits um, or the current bedtime process. So we're going to adjust those activities. Like I said, I really make for more calming, wind down time, dimmer lights, closing curtains, um, winding down earlier um, so that the kid is really ready for sleep at this later time. I make sure parents know that this later bedtime is not our end goal and that we're going to be moving it forward. Um, and then I don't use it often with really young kiddos as they can be more susceptible um, to getting overtired um, um, and becoming more hyperactive or irritable. So positive reinforcement um, is an important part of any intervention that you're using with kids. <clears throat> um, and so a few, you know, lots of different types of positive reinforcement. There's praise, you know, which is um, really important. I'm often teaching parents about catching their kids being good um, during the bedtime routine and making sure they're using lots of specific labeled praises. I love that you opened your mouth right away to brush your teeth. I love how quickly you got on your pajamas. Um, that, you know, using reward charts and um, is something I do often for any kind of sleep behavior. Um, and then teaching parents, of course, you know, that their presence and their attention is going to be the most powerful reinforcer for a child. So just making sure that we're thinking about the timing of their attention and that they're involved in paying attention when kids are doing things that they want them to be doing so they can be providing attention and praise and that they're minimizing it when they're not. Um, and so, you know, I'll make sure that parents are taking um, breaks from doing the dishes or other things when the routine is quiet and going well and making sure they're popping up to let them know they're doing a great job. Um, we don't want parents just getting involved when things, you know, when somebody's smearing toothpaste on the mirror. Um, sleep fairy um, is a great intervention for preschool children and young school age children. Um, it can be um, the sleep fairy, um, of course, is friends with the tooth fairy, um, but unlike the very daring tooth fairy who leaves things under pillows when kids are sleeping, um, the sleep fairy leaves prizes on the kitchen table. Um, and so really it's magical. The sleep fairy can write a note to the young kiddo letting them know what sleep behavior they're looking um, um, to leave a prize for. You know, it could be not using a bedtime pass or sleeping all night on their own. Um, and then if they do that, then the sleep fairy leaves a prize out on the kitchen table. So what's great about it is it's magical. Kids love it. Um, and um, it really separates the rules and the rewards from the parent, right? This isn't the parent. This is the sleep fairy. So kids really love this. Good morning, Light. Um, um, so unlike parents who can look at the clock when they wake up to see what time it is, right? Kids can't do that when they wake up in the middle of the night. So sometimes that will result in kids coming into parents' room asking, is it time to get up? Can we play? Or when we're working with kids, you know, asking them to sleep all night on their own, it's really tricky for them to know when all night is over. <clears throat> 
So good morning light provides kids with a cue to know when it is okay to wake up and leave their room. Um, so there are a lot of um, good morning lights on the market that, you know, fancy ones that parents can buy. I usually um, will just recommend that parents will get a timer, like an um, like a old school um, timer from a hardware store or a smart plug, um, and put it on a nightlight they already have. Um, and then you want to make sure that light turns on near bedtime and that they reference to it a lot. So they're kind of pointing to it and they're saying the light is on, the moon is up, it's time to sleep. So you really want to repeatedly reference back to it um, so that kids start to know to use it as a cue. Um, and then um, at, in the middle of the night, if the kid gets up and the light is still on, parents are just bringing them back, minimal interaction, pointing at the light, saying the light is on, the moon is still up, it's time to sleep. Importantly, then you're setting the light to turn off at the earliest time that a child could wake. So if they wake between 5 and 5.30, maybe I'd have parents set it for 4.50. We initially want to have some success. Um, and if everybody wants to check to make sure they're muted, um, that would be awesome. I'm seeing, hearing some background from somebody. Um, and then in the morning, they're, they're just giving praise. You know, you stayed in, your light is off. It's time to wake up um, and giving a lot of praise around that. <clears throat> so um, once kids are doing well and having a lot of success, you can slowly fade wait time a little later um, um, to reach a desired wait time. And then this can be used for nap time as well. Um, so nighttime fears, um, you know, nighttime fears are really common for young kids, um, really common in ages three to five as they start to engage in more fantasy. Um, and um, so often we won't need intervention for nighttime fears, but when they really persist or really start to interfere with sleep, then that can be when intervention is helpful. Um, so little evidence for empirically based approaches for fears in this group, but clinically, you know, I and others have found that fantasy can be a really helpful approach, you know, finding ways to help kids feel they can get rid of or defeat the feared object. <clears throat> so there are some different schools of thought about this. Some think that using fantasy in this way is um, in a way reinforcing the child's belief that the feared object is real. <clears throat> From my experience and thinking through cognitive development at a young age, um, the child already very much thinks the thing is real and hearing that it's not real does very little to alleviate their fears. And um, by the time a, a kid reaches me or you, um, their parent has already told them repeatedly monsters aren't real and it's done little to help. Um, so, you know, I find that it's, it's more helpful to kind of tap into where they are developmentally and use fantasy as kind of their, their superpower. And how can we think of fun and creative ways to defeat or get rid of the feared objects so they feel more in control um, and they feel less scared. <clears throat> So monster spray is one great way. It's an easy intervention, you know, like bug spray that keeps bugs away. Monster spray, you spray it in the room. I give parents the very secret recipe um, and they make it at home, spray it around the room at night um, and then it keeps the monsters away. <clears throat> Um, the great news is, is it can be whatever you want. So it can be witch spray or dragon spray or bad guy spray. Um, and so that's something that kids really love and it can be really helpful. Um, I'll often just talk a lot with kids about fun ways that they want to, you know, defeat. Like I worked with one young kid um, recently who was really scared about big animals being in his room, like lions or tigers. So he came up with this elaborate, you know, creative thing about how he was going to use his Spider-Man net to trap them and then a slingshot to sling them to outer space. Um, and this plan felt really good to him and he felt much safer. <clears throat> Um, huggy puppy is one intervention that does have some empirical support. So in this intervention, children um, were given a puppy and told one of two stories. They were either asked to take care of the puppy at night, um, you know, provide it reassurance, hug it, take care of it, or they were told that the puppy was going to serve as their protector. And both in both story groups, both intervention groups were found to be effective for nighttime fears with both having a reduction in fears, improvement in sleep that was maintained six months later. So then common behavioral sleep problems in school age children and adolescents. <clears throat> Nighttime fears, um, you know, 
what we see often um, in the sleep clinic is kids having a fear of the dark. Um, we'll use exposure-based games to help with overcoming fear of the dark. Um, what they do is they associate a fun activity with the fear dark room and then just provide them with increasingly longer opportunities um, to tolerate being in the dark room alone. So lots of different variations. The most common one I use is a flashlight treasure hunt game, which is basically hide and go seek with a flashlight. Parents go in the room, hide an object, initially really um, easy. Kids go in with a flashlight and find it. Initially, they don't have to be in there long. Gradually, as they get used to it, parents hide it harder. Um, and they're starting to kind of learn to be in dark rooms for longer periods of time. Um, and as they're kind of learning to tolerate that better. Um, so, you know, all of these interventions for fears, um, I'll work with kids to um, teach anxiety management strategies. So um, for young kids, coping self statements or what we call brave talk, I am brave, my room is safe. For older kids, we're working on cognitive restructuring, you know, taking anxious thoughts such as someone's going to break in tonight, we're starting to, you know, look for evidence for and against and starting to develop um, some new, um, more helpful and true thoughts to talk back, um, then introducing some relaxation-based strategies, breathing, um, progressive muscle relaxation. We'll talk about using positive visual imagery and changing the channel on our brain um, at bedtime. And then we're always pairing um, with rewards um, for bravery as they're working towards, um, you know, their goals of tolerating more time in the dark or parents moving further away. Um, so graduated extinction for older children, right? So older kids who have that negative sleep onset association of needing a parent present, which is one of the most common things I see in the sleep clinic is kids who need their parent with them to fall asleep um, and then wake up at night and need parents again. Um, so with these kiddos, we're, we're um, teaching them to fall asleep independently. Um, the most common thing that I use is just um, gradual removal of parent presence. Um, so I start with wherever the parent currently is. So if the parent's currently laying in bed with the child. And then every three to five nights, we're picking what I call a new brave spot. Um, and that might be a big jump, like they're sitting in a chair next to the bed, or it might be a small jump, like they're just sitting up in bed with their, their back against the headboard. And then next, they're sitting on the side of the bed with their legs hanging off. Um, our goal is just to find brave spots that we switch every three to five nights, where the parent will be at the beginning of the night while they're falling asleep. We're slowly moving closer to the door as kids are learning to tolerate um, being further away from a parent and starting to become more comfortable with falling asleep on their own. So for older children, some kids do really well with just a checking method. Um, you know, these might be kids who feel a little bit more nervous or anxious, um, but, um, um, but can do okay if parents are just checking on them every two or three minutes. So I'll start with parents doing really brief checks, providing some praise for staying in bed and being brave. And then over time, just lengthening those checks. Um, take a break is an intervention where a parent kind of who's sitting in the room when a child falls asleep will just determine um, how long it takes to fall asleep. So say it takes 10 minutes and at the halfway point, um, they'll take a break. You know, I have to go to the bathroom. I have to go find my phone quick. I have to get a drink of water. Initially, the break's gonna be really short. They're gonna leave and come back 10, 15 seconds later, 30 seconds later, provide the child with praise for being brave and staying in bed, and then they stay till they fall asleep. Each night, this continues with parents make, taking a break and slowly lengthening the time of that break. Kids start to get used to the pattern that my parent leaves, but they come back, start to trust the process and start to tolerate um, the parent being gone. And parents just gradually increase that time until eventually they're leaving. And by the time they come back, their kid has fallen asleep. So recurrent nightmares. Um, so nightmares are common. They typically don't require treatment, but um, for some kids who are frequently having nightmares and they're really disrupting um, sleep or having becoming so they're they're so fearful that they're starting to be scared to fall asleep, um, then intervention can be helpful. 
Um, so we always want to evaluate um, for trauma, of course, and we want to be making sure we're making referrals for good evidence-based um, trauma-focused therapy when it's appropriate. Um, because we know nightmares increase um, with daytime stress, and if kids have an inconsistent schedule or aren't getting enough sleep, that's always where I start, um, you know, making sure that kids are getting enough sleep, um, and then identifying stressors and making sure that they have support and coping skills around those stressors. And then we use imagery rehearsal therapy for kids. I talk about this as being the boss of your dreams. Our goal is to replace their frightening dream content with more benign content. So I'll sometimes have kids describe a nightmare in detail. They'll tell me all about it. We can um, talk about it or write or draw it, find some way to destroy the dream, um, throw it away. And then I'll often work with kids on, you know, that they get to be the author or the movie director, and they're either going to erase or rewind all the way back to the part before the dream was scary. Um, and so we'll, we'll erase all the way back or we'll rewind, um, and then they get to decide the new dream. So they might have a positive ending. They might give themselves a power role where they get to do something really awesome to, de you know, defeat the scary part of the dream. They might make the scary thing really silly, or they just come up with an entirely different dream. But we spend a lot of time um, recreating this new dream um, and drawing pictures of it. I make sure that they're using all five senses as they're thinking through this dream. We talk about it. We share it with the parent. Um, they draw a picture, hang it by their bed, um, and then it's something that parents are kind of referencing to before bed and if they wake in the middle of the night with a nightmare. Kind of like, oh, let's change the channel back to your new dream. So um, insomnia, um, you know, as you know, difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep common for adolescents and school age children, more prevalent in females. Um, important to note is that chronic insomnia is a significant risk factor for the development of depression and suicide. So if we're meeting with um, a school age child or a teen who has been struggling with chronic insomnia, we wanna make sure that we're assessing for suicidality. Um, CBTI, um, as you know, involves sleep hygiene, stimulus control, sleep restriction, um, relaxation training, and cognitive modification. As I'm sure you're all well versed on, um, you know, um, stimulus control therapy, we're, we're really trying to target that conditioned arousal. So we want to reassociate that bed and bedtime with sleep. Um, so our goal is to use the bed only for sleeping, um, and that sleep should only occur in the bed. Again, we saw a lot of this um, with the pandemic with kids basically doing school from their beds um, and spending a lot of time in their bed. So really helping them to find spaces off of their bed to do things like school and other activities. Only going to bed when we're sleepy, um, you know, having them get out of bed if they're not sleeping after about 15, 20 ish minutes. Um, I'll sit down with teens and we'll often kind of make a list, divide it in half like this. And I have them list all the things they do in their bed. They kind of laugh and they come up with this elaborate list of, you know, everything that they do. Um, and then we talk about how when, you know, we get into bed, it's really confusing for our brain and body to know what to do because there's, you know, one of 15 activities, you know, that it's trying to pick to do. But that if we can whittle that down to just sleep, it makes it a lot easier for our brain and body to know exactly what we'd like it to do. So then we work on problem solving, how we can um, do those other activities in different areas um, of the house or the room. Sleep restriction, of course, we're going to limit the time in bed to the time that they're sleeping to really build up that sleep pressure. Um, you guys know a lot about this. Of course, with kids, um, you know, we're never really going to restrict less than six and a half to seven and a half hours. And we want to be mindful if we're restricting a teenager to seven hours or less, um, that they're, if they are of driving age, that while we're working on this, um, that parents are the ones who are driving. Of course, as sleep improves, then we're going to open up that sleep window um, 15 minutes every week. Our goal is to work towards, um, you know, getting sufficient sleep, but maintaining that optimal sleep efficiency. And then we're going to target that physiologic and cognitive arousal um, that's really interfering with falling asleep and staying asleep. So, you know, as you guys know, um, with chronic insomnia, a lot of people are, um, teens um, are building up a lot of maladaptive negative cognitions about sleep, right? If I don't fall asleep now, tomorrow's going to, you know, not go well. I'm going to be really tired. My test isn't going to go well. A lot of catastrophic thoughts about sleep and those consequences of poor sleep. So 
we're working on using cognitive um, therapy tools um, to really kind of evaluate these thoughts um, logically and come up with more helpful and true thoughts to talk back. And then relaxation therapy, teaching kids and teens, you know, um, diaphragmatic breathing, calm breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, and um, visual imagery. And then finding the right combination. So kind of thinking through all these interventions, you know, I know I went through quickly. Um, when, when I kind of approach um, a, um, a case, I'm always thinking about starting with a consistent sleep schedule, healthy sleep habits, a bedtime routine always, and education. And then I'm just thinking about with the current situation, what supports do I need to increase for the child and the family to help them fall asleep more easily and really kind of target the stress or negative emotions and, and often that parent-child negative interaction. So thinking about what extra support does this family need right now? Like, will a later bedtime, a bedtime pass? Do we need to make the parent more present and then gradually kind of pull them away? So we kind of pull together what the family needs to initially quiet things down. And then over time, as things improve, we're just gradually pulling those supports away um, to help maintain um, the positive sleep, um, you know, that they've developed. Oh, sorry about that. Let's see. All right. Right back. So summary, pediatric sleep is multifaceted. Sleep patterns change across development. Numerous developmental and psychosocial factors are going to influence sleep at each stage. Um, behavioral sleep problems are common um, and can result in chronic insufficient sleep and really impact the functioning and well-being of the child and the family. Um, the good news is behavioral interventions are effective. Um, so consistency, education, and really making sure that we're tailoring interventions to the family and the child is important. So some resources for providers. These are great books, in particular, the, um, the Green Book um, by Dr. Lisa Meltzer and Dr. Valerie Crabtree. Um, is, it's a great book that gives kind of step-by-step kind of a step-by-step -step walkthrough of behavioral interventions with um, teens and kids. Um, it talks through a lot of the interventions that we talked about today. For parents, um, babysleep.com is an amazing resource. Um, the book that I recommend to parents when they're searching for something to read is Jody Mendel's book, Sleeping Through the Night. And then resources for kids with special needs. Autism um, Speaks um, has a great toolkit um, for strategies to improve sleep in kids with autism spectrum disorder. Um, Mark Durand has a great book um, called Sleep Better, a guide to improving sleep for children with special needs. Those can be a great reference for you guys. Um, and then a few of uh, my kids, um, missing the last one, but um so yeah any questions at all i think sally first wants to um wants to send something out yes. to you guys in the chat um and then i can answer questions yes um if you would please answer just a few questions so we can continue to provide important you know topics and see how we're doing and improve so if you would please answer these brief four questions um, I'll just leave them up here for a few seconds. I did have one question, if you can hear me. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Shelly, is that okay, or do you want them to be yes, filling that no, up? Yes, no, that's oh. fine. That's okay. fine. Sounds so good. when I was in residency, a big book that I was referred to was uh, Richard Ferber, Dr. Richard Ferber's uh, yeah. book. Um, I didn't know if you had any opinions on that one, per se. You know, um, so... Not like any specific, you know, opinions. Um, I um, haven't read through the whole thing. I know a lot about, you know, the Ferber method. I let a lot of people call cry it out. Um, you know, I um, have found that I think that Jody Mandel's book, Sleeping Through the Night, is just really well-rounded and is a book that a lot of families um, can relate to and a lot of great strategies kind of all around. Um, you know, I think that I have really found one that I kind of stick to and like, because I think what parents are kind of bombarded with is there are a million self-help books for um, kids and sleep, and they often provide contradictory um, kind of information. Um, so, um, you know, I really encourage parents to try to not 
overwhelm themselves by kind of consuming them all um, because I think it's easy for them to get really lost in all of them. That's fair. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Time for awakening for extinguishing sleep terror. So I think everybody can see it, but somebody said, please explain timed awakening for extinguishing sleep terror. So, um, you know, timed awakening would be something that would I that I use very minimally. Um, so timed awakening for sleep terrors tends to work best if the child is waking very consistently at the same time, <clears throat> which almost never happens. Um, and so, you know, if, if parents kind of keep sleep log and they can tell me like almost like clockwork at 10 PM, their kid is always waking up having a sleep terror. Um, then there, you know, is some, like I said, I don't use it often, but there's, you know, some evidence to support that if you wake up a child, you know, about 15 minutes or so before, just kind of gently rouse them um, before um, that um, time um, that you can kind of bypass uh, that um, sleep terror. Um, and, um, it, it can work really well. It's, it's really hard though, if it's more of a real world situation where one day it's at nine o'clock, one day it doesn't happen at all. The next day it happens at 11, the next day it happens at midnight. Um, and so, um, that's one that's used less often, you know, um, with sleep terrors, I'm, um, really working with families, um, to kind of first and foremost, you know, the thing that I find seems to help the most is making is kind of some of those important, um, sleep hygiene, um, and, and, um, sleep schedule, um, things. So, you know, often it's being triggered by kids not getting enough sleep. So I found by really kind of helping families establish a really consistent sleep schedule, making sure that they're lengthening sleep so that sleep is appropriate for the child and that we're having a really calm, consistent, relaxing bedtime routine can, um, can often help with some of those, you know, not always some kids are going to continue to have them. And then we'll talk about best responses to them, but I found that to be really helpful. We're a little past the hour, so if okay. there are no more questions, we will end this webinar. But thank you so much, Dr. Amble. Yeah. You, did, yeah. you did a terrific job, and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, and thanks to everyone for attending. Have a good day. Yeah, you too, Sally.